You're on an important phone call. You ever been on on an important phone call and you either go out of range and your cell phone loses service and you get disconnected or just maybe you're on the phone with the insurance company or a doctor and you've had to go through all the rigmarole of punching this button and that button and that button and you finally get to the right person and what happens? You get disconnected. And you have to start all over again. Or, or guys, maybe, maybe you're watching the ball game right at the most important, critical point of the game. And what happens to the cable? The cable goes out. And you get disconnected. Or maybe, maybe you're using a circular saw and you're making these really important cuts. And, and right when you're about to you know, make this really important cut, you accidentally unplug the cord and your saw gets disconnected. I don't know how many times that's happened to Vicki in our life. I don't know how many times. She's the one that uses the circular saw in, in our life. huh? Man, there's nothing worse than getting disconnected. A few years ago, we had a situation that proved uh, uh, quite, quite bad where, where we experienced this, dis- this disconnection. We were living in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we were about to travel from Chattanooga to Ohio for a two-week vacation. Our, our parents live in Ohio, and so we were, we were getting ready in the morning to go on vacation, and so I have this habit, this custom. Vicki says it's not a good custom, but I have this custom of, of wanting to disconnect all of the electrical appliances before we go on vacation. Does anybody else do that? You disconnect? All right, Vicki, look around. There's other smart people in the room that do that. All right, and so I, you know, I disconnect the washer, I disconnect the dryer, I disconnect anything that could potentially spark and cause a problem. Why am I going to run that risk? We're going to disconnect it while we're on vacation. And so Vicky and the boys and Amber were out in the van, and I'm running around the house the last minute just pulling plugs as fast as I possibly can. And while I'm disconnecting the washer and the dryer and everything, I accidentally disconnect the freezer in our house. I didn't know I disconnected the freezer. I just thought I disconnected the washer and dryer. And so, and so we, we closed the door and locked up and went on vacation for two weeks. And it was right in the middle of the summer. Now, now what I failed to tell you was that our freezer was filled with meats. Absolutely filled. Vicky's parents give us a half of beef, and it was filled with a half of beef there in the freezer and had fish and everything. We went on vacation, unbeknownst to us, that I had disconnected the freezer. Two weeks later, we had this wonderful vacation, and we got in our car in Ohio and drove 10, 12 hours back to Chattanooga, and we're tired, and we pull in our driveway. I remember it went something like this. I'm not sure if this is exactly the way it went. We pulled in the driveway and kind of sat there for a second and looked at our house and thought, doesn't our house look great? God's blessed us with such a, a wonderful house. And so kind of taking in how nice our house looked on the outside, opened up the garage and, and put the key in the door to go into the entryway, and I couldn't open up the door. And I thought, that's odd. And so I, I started pushing the door open and... Uh, I had to push it, and I noticed a bunch of flies that started coming out. And then I looked down, and to my amazement, I saw about two inches of liquid blood that were all, all throughout our entryway. To, to make a long story short, it was absolutely horrible. After 10 hours of driving, after two weeks on vacation, we spent the good part of a day or a day and a half cleaning up dried blood and killing hundreds of flies in our house. So this morning when I tell you that it's not fun to be disconnected, believe me, I know what I'm talking about. It's not fun to be disconnected. Now today I want you to catch this because many times our lives are just like our house when we came back on vacation. Many times our our lives look great on the outside. We, We look as if we have everything all together. But on the inside, there's a disconnect. On the inside, there is something that disconnected, and we are disconnected 
from God. Whether it's in every area of our life or whether it's in just a few areas of our life. And that disconnect in our life causes a stinky mess in our life. I'm afraid that happens often in in our lives, even as believers, that happens. We see that in the passage that we're looking at today, or actually we see the counter of that in the passage that we're looking at today. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. This is such a great chapter. We're going to begin reading in verse 15. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. We'll put it up on the screen. Follow along. Paul says this, so be careful how you live. Now we could pause right there. What a great message. Be careful how you live. And then he continues, don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. We'll we'll explain what that means in just a few moments. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly. The the word is foolishly. Don't act foolishly. But understand what the Lord wants you to do. Verse 18 is a well-known verse. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will run your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks to God for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Verse 25, it's not on the screen for husbands. This means love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for her. Would you pray with me today? Father, what a, what a wonderful service it's been. Thank you so much for the fact that we've been able to worship you as a family Thank you once again for all of these moms that are here. and Father, I just pray that today would be a very special day for them. Help them to feel loved. Help them to feel honored. And now, Lord, as we open up your word, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would teach us. Help us to understand what the Apostle Paul meant to say when he wrote these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so many years ago. Father, I pray that there wouldn't be a disconnect in our lives. Help us to to not only be hearers of the word, as Brad spoke on last week, but help us to be doers of the word as well. Help us to not live like fools, but help us to be wise in the way that we live. And God, I pray that we would have families that would honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week, Brad began a series that we've simply called Connecting the Dots. The the idea being that we need to connect what God says in his word to our daily lives. Uh, The longer I'm in ministry, the more I see, even in my life and in the life of others, how easy it is for us to hear God's word on a regular basis, but not apply it to our lives. We're, We're hearers, but we're not doers. For some reason, there's no connection between what God says in his word and what we are doing. And so therefore, we can even come to church week after week and hear God's word preached, but our life not change. We live the same way that we have always lived. Today, our goal is is very simple. Today, our goal is to connect what God says in his word about the family with our families. To connect what God says in his word about husbands and dads and wives and mothers and children with the way we live. 
So in other words, like Brad illustrated last week, we're going to look in the mirror of God's word where God says this is the way husbands and wives and relationships should be. And my goal, my prayer is that we examine our relationships in the light of God's word. Let me make three introductory statements that are in your outline today. The first is this. God is all about the family. Let me say that again. God is all about the family. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because God invented the family. We say that there's three institutions, or, 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 or better yet, the Bible shows that there's three institutions that God originated, that God created. The family was the first one of those. You know the story there in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Here's Adam. He's all alone, and God brings a help meet to him, and he introduces Eve to Adam and Adam to Eve and says, Adam, I've searched the world, and I found the most beautiful lady in the world for you and that first wedding was performed there in 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 the garden of eden god is all about the family i believe in a very real sense that that god is pleased when families come together and and worship together even in days like this mother's day so i want you to know that god is interested in your family whatever your family looks like uh, whether you're a single mom here today, God's interested in your family. Whether you're a blended family, God is interested in your family. Whatever your family looks like, God is interested in your family because God is all about the family. We see that over and over again in his word. Here's the second thing that we'll see in our passage today. It's this. Your personal life matters to God. Your personal life matters to God. At times, we try to, uh, you know, separate the spiritual from the secular. Well, you know what, that's all about church, and that's, uh, that's how I behave when I go to church, but when I'm not in church, this is the way uh, that I live. That's personal. Listen, God doesn't separate the spiritual from the secular. God is interested in your personal life. God doesn't want you to honor him just on Sunday and then the other six days of the week are yours to live however you want. God is interested in your personal life. We see that in this passage. The third thing that we see and we're going to develop in the message is this. The condition of your relationships with others directly affects your relationship with God. Let me say that again, that's a powerful point. The condition of your relationships with others directly affects your relationship with God. So this morning, I, I want to ask you to be honest with yourself. Do your relationships honor God? You say, Brian, which relationships are you talking about? All of them. <laughs> All of them, whether you're talking about your relationship with your mom and dad, whether you're talking about your relationship with your spouse, whether it's with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, your son or your daughter, your employer or your employees, do your relationships honor God? And we realize as a church that our church is only as strong as the families which make up our congregation. In order for our church to be strong, our families must be strong. In order for our church to be stable, our families must be stable. In order for our church to be spiritual, our families must be spiritual. We began reading in verse 15 this morning, but the context, uh, the context actually goes back to the beginning of the chapter. And so before we dig into our outline, would you go back with me all the way to the first verse of chapter 5? We're going to walk through this quickly, but we're going to walk through this chapter today and see exactly what it is the Apostle Paul is saying and how it applies to us. Notice verse 1. Paul says this, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Would you read that with me today? Let's read it today. It's up on the screen. Let's all read it together. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. There's a word that jumps right off the page as the chapter begins. It's the word imitate, the word 
imitation. And so the first thing that we see that I have in my outline, if you're following along, the first thing that I wrote down is this. Transformation involves imitation. You see, God is saying that in order for for my relationships to be right and and then my relationship with God to be right, there must be an internal transformation that's taking place in my life and yours. You're familiar with that. One of the encouraging things it is for me as a pastor is to see God changing lives. And I love to watch how God is changing you and how you're living out that promise in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man or woman is in Christ, he or she is what? A new creation. Old things are passed away and all things are becoming new. It's so cool for me to watch that in your life. But here, Paul says, listen, not only must you... Must you be transformed internally? But that transformation involves imitation. Imitate God. The word imitate that's found is derived from the term from which we get our words mime or mimic. Uh, It refers to someone who copies specific characteristics of another person. You ever tried to imitate someone? You ever seen anybody do a really bad job of imitating someone else? Let me give you a couple examples. Let me do a couple of imitations and see if you know who I'm imitating today, okay? I'm not a, I'm not a professional imitator, but let me do the very best I can, okay? Here's the first one. Ready? Rest on your feet with me this morning, would you? <laughs> who am I? Who am I? Vernita. Was that a good imitation of Vernita or not? I'm not sure whether that was a good imitation of Vernita or not. Uh, Vernita, they say that imitation is the greatest form of flattery, so I don't know, okay? That's Vernita, okay? Who am I right now? <laughs> Who am I right now? I'm Brad Creviston, right? Brad Creviston. Hey, imitation means that you take something, take a characteristic of somebody else, and you imitate it, you copy it in your life. That's the term that the Apostle Paul is using here. Now, the Apostle Paul is not saying imitate Vernita or imitate Brad, imitate your favorite celebrity, or imitate the pastor. What does Paul say? Paul says, imitate God. Imitate God. Years ago, those those, uh, wristbands, Those wristbands were really popular that simply had WWJD on them. People were wearing them all over the place. What did that stand for? It stood for this phrase, what would Jesus do? And the idea is that I would ask myself and you would ask yourself in every situation of life before we respond, before we react, before we act, what would Jesus do in this situation? What's the idea? The idea was this, that we should imitate God. So church, catch this today. Transformation, that eternal tra- or that internal transformation begins with imitation. Husbands, catch this today. The more you imitate God, the more successful you will be in your marriage. Wives, the more you imitate God, the more successful you will be as a wife. Successful mothers are God imitators. Let me ask you this morning, who are you imitating? Who are you copying? Who are you trying to imitate? Who are you trying to live like? Paul says this, imitate God. Transformation begins with imitation. Notice the second thing. Go to verse 3. As we continue reading in the passage, Paul says this, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Notice how Paul says, such sins have no place among God's people. Verse four, obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you, Paul says. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things 
of this world. Here's the second thing Paul says. Transformation not only involves imitation, but transformation involves consecration. Transformation involves living differently. And Paul takes a few verses here and graphically describes the activities that should not be found in the life of a believer. Notice the verse. These aren't Brian's words. These are Paul's words inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. He says, let there be no sexual immorality. The word that is used there is a very specific word. It's the Greek word porneia. It comes from the root from which we get our word pornography. And the apostle Paul is saying, let there be no pornography in the church. Some might sit back and say, hey, that's not me. Paul is using this term referring to all sexual sin. Paul is saying, let there not be sexual sin in the church. Man, can we just stop for a second and have a a church meeting? Can we do that for just a second? Because in the church today, and I'm not talking necessarily about our church, I'm talking about in the church today, there is a there is a movement, there is a what I would call a rebellion that is taking place. Theologians use the term sexual atheism. You say, Brian, what does that refer to? That refers to individuals who love God, who claim to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior that want to worship the Lord on Sundays they're in church, they're active in ministry, they give God almost every aspect of their life, but sexually they live as if God did not exist. Sexually they live as if God set no parameters in his word. It's as if they're saying, God, I give you every area of my life except this area right here. God, I'm going to do what I want to do in this area. And here's what Paul says. Let there be no immorality in the church. Church, I'm afraid that we are allowing the mindset of the world to corrupt our view of life and the way that we live our lives. And I'm amazed that so many people can live in a certain way and have the idea that God is being honored and glorified, even acting as if they were being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And you'll see here in the passage that Paul is saying, if those actions, those attitudes are evident in your life, the Holy Spirit of God is not controlling you. Paul says, man, let there be no immorality Notice how Paul proceeds. He uses the term impurity. The word impurity comes from the same word as disgraceful. It carries the idea of dirty speech, greed, the the idea of wanting more. And man, have we allowed materialism to creep in. It's like we can never have enough. Even as believers, we want more and more. And we, we fail to grasp that concept of being satisfied with that which God has given to us. Such sins have no place among God's people. Verse four, obscene stories foolish talk. It's interesting the phrase that Paul uses for foolish talk actually means stupid talk. It's the word from which we get our word moron. Paul is saying, listen, don't talk like a moron. No moronic talk needs to be coming out of your mouth. We could continue describing the terms that Paul uses in the passage, but the basic idea is that children of God should live differently. Amen? Amen. Children of God should live differently. The way we live, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we think should honor God. Our bodies, our minds, Our tongues should be consecrated to him. In the very beginning, we said that your personal life matters to God. Let me say as lovingly and as pastorally as I possibly can this morning. All right, 
If your life is wrapped up in materialism, you're not being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. If sexually you're living in a way that God does not honor God, you are not being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. If your language is impure, if it's disgraceful, if it's disgusting, if it's moronic, you are not being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. You see, when the Holy Spirit of God comes in you, his goal is to help you to imitate Jesus Christ and to demonstrate consecration. There's one other thing that we see in verses 15 through 17. We already read those verses. We saw that transformation involves imitation. Transformation involves consecration. He says transformation involves introspection. Notice verse 15 once again. So be careful how you live. Introspection has the idea of personal examination. Paul here exhorts us to take a close look at ourselves. Depending upon the translation that you have, the NASB and the NIV says this, be careful. The ESV says it this way, look carefully. The Holman Bible says this, pay careful attention to. The word that's used comes from the Greek word blepo. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Well, uh, and, and sometimes I act like a Greek scholar. I'm not. I took two semesters of Greek in college, all right? And the word blepo was my favorite word. You say, Brian, why was it your favorite word? Did it have a deep truth? No, I just liked the way it sounded. And every time the professor said blepo, I would sit in the back of the class and kind of giggle just a little bit. And so, uh, and so I'm familiar with this word. It means to do what? It means to look, but it's reflexive. It doesn't mean for me to look at Mark or me to look at Glenn or Dennis. It's for me to look at me. It's for you to look at you. And so Paul says this, look at yourself. Do a careful examination of yourself. The idea is not that we should observe others, but rather that we should take a close look at ourselves. Brad illustrated that point last week with the mirror. He illustrated it so perfectly. The idea is this, as believers, we should be constantly evaluating ourselves. We find that all throughout the Bible. Lamentations 340, instead, let us test ourselves and examine our ways. Let us turn back to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, examine yourselves to see if you are, or, or if your faith is genuine. You see, you must see yourself. The second thing that Paul alludes to is this. You must change the way you live. Notice verse 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. The New King James says it this way. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now, you and I read that, and our translators have kind of watered down to a certain degree the meaning of the word. But in Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16, Paul uses the harshest words that are found in the New Testament. Paul says, live wisely, don't be a fool. You say, Brian, what does the term fool mean? The term fool means a a person that is deprived of the ability to make wise decisions. A person who is mentally incapacitated, a person who looks at two different things and chooses the unwise one, a person who would look at a knife and not realize that that knife would cut them and therefore they would play with the knife and cut themselves. That is a foolish person, a person that doesn't have the ability to look at something and determine whether it's helpful or whether it's hurtful. That's the word that Paul uses in the passage. Paul says, don't be a fool. Don't be like the person who makes unwise decisions, looks at two different options, and chooses the wrong one. What's the idea? He says, allow the Holy Spirit of God to change the way you live. And then he says this, you must know and do the Lord's will. Notice verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. I'm looking at a really smart crowd today. I can tell you're smart because you look smart, all right? 
I mean that. For the most part, we know what God wants us to do. The question is not whether we know what we should do or shouldn't do. The question is whether we do what we know we shouldn't do or what we should do. So here's what Paul says. Understand what the will of the Lord is for you. You must be internally transformed. Man, catch this. Here's the second thing, and here's the main gist of the message. Paul says you must be completely controlled. You must be completely controlled. Notice verse 18. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Here's a couple of things that I wrote in my notes. The first is this. Being filled with the Spirit means that nothing else will control you. The NIV says it this way, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. The NLT, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. The Holman says, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions. Obviously, in this verse, we find a strong exhortation against drunkenness, a concept that's repeated throughout Scripture, but that's not the point that Paul is making in the passage. Paul is not talking about whether you should drink or shouldn't drink in the passage. That's not in the context what he is talking about. He is simply demonstrating the fact that we should not let our minds and our bodies be controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit of God. And so if anything else, whether it's a a foreign substance, whether it's a, a desire, whether it's a habit, whether it's an addiction, anything else in my life that comes in and controls me other than the Holy Spirit of God is not God's will for my life, and it's not God's will for your life as well. Here's the second thing that I wrote down. I want you to catch this. Being filled with the Spirit does not mean that you have more of Him but that he has more of you. (laughs) Sometimes we read this verse as if, you know, when we trust Christ, we're handed a glass and we're given part of the Holy Spirit of God and we walk around and the glass isn't half full and the idea is, God, I want all the Holy Spirit, fill my glass. That's not the idea that the Apostle Paul is making in the passage. It's not that we don't have all of him and we need more of him. That's not the idea. The idea is this, is one of control. The best illustration is not a glass that's half full or half empty, but the best illustration is this, it's a steering wheel. And the question is this, who is behind the steering wheel of your life? Remember the bumper stickers that people used to put on the back of their cars that said, God is my co-pilot. I never liked those bumper stickers because because the co-pilot only does what? What the pilot tells him to do. All right, the pilot can look at him and say, hey, you're not flying the plane today. I'm flying the plane today. You're not driving. I'm driving. God doesn't want to be your co-pilot. God wants to be your pilot. God wants to be behind the steering wheel of your life. He wants to be guiding and directing your life. Being filled with the Spirit does not mean that you have more of Him, but that He has more of you. Hey, hey, church, catch this. The moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, would you pause for a second and think back to when that was? For a few of you, that was a few weeks ago. For others of you, it was a few months ago. For others of us, it was a few years ago. Whenever that moment was that you realized that you were a sinner and you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and your sins were forgiven, at that moment you received all of the Holy Spirit of God. He indwelt you. The question is not whether you have more of him. The question is this, how much of you does he have is he controlling your life or are you controlling your life it's not about having more of him it's about him having more of us here's the third thing that i wrote down being filled with the spirit produces tangible results I know our time is getting away from us but the grammatical construction of this chapter is so clear because the the command, uh, the command is be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And then Paul gives, he, he finishes with three participles which, which describe what a Holy Spirit controlled person looks like. 
The Holy Spirit-controlled person is not a person that's ecstatic or emotional. That's not the way Paul describes such a person. He actually uses three descriptions of a Holy Spirit-controlled person, and they're in the next three verses. Notice verse 19. He says, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music in your hearts to the Lord. Here's what Paul is saying. A Holy Spirit-controlled person is a happy person. That's how, that's why Paul could be in prison and be singing praises to the Lord. Because our contentment is not based upon who we are, it's based upon who we have. It's not based upon where we are, but it's based upon the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. Verse 20, and give thanks to everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, a Holy Spirit-controlled person is a, is a happy person. A Holy Spirit-controlled person is a thankful person. Giving thanks for everything, the good and the bad. Verse 21, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. A Holy Spirit-controlled person is a submissive person. A person who submits himself or herself to the needs of others. Hey, here's what Paul says in the passage. He says, listen, listen, when there is a connection between what God says in his word and the way you live, several things are going to take place. There will be an internal transformation that changes the way you live. Secondly, there will be complete control. As you surrender to the Holy Spirit of God, he will control you. But here's the third thing, and here's what I want to say in the message. So if you haven't caught anything else, catch this. The third thing Paul says is this. Your relationships will be dramatically affected. The way that you relate with others will be dramatically affected. The sentence begins in verse 18. And it's one continuous sentence all the way through verse 23. And the paragraph goes all the way through chapter 6 and verse 4. You, you say, Brian, what happens in the rest of the chapter? Well, you might not remember, but in the rest of the chapter, Paul gives us the most detailed description of how our relationship should be in all of the New Testament. Verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, or your wife, you should only have one, by the way. <laughs> husbands, love your wife, just as Christ loved the church. Parents, bring your kids up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Children, obey your parents. Employers, treat your employees with dignity and respect. Employees, respond to your employer, realizing that God puts leaders in your life. Paul goes from there, and he talks about all of the relationships in our life. All of that relationship talk begins with what? With the command, be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. You see, here's the idea. When the Holy Spirit of God is controlling me, it changes the way that I relate to my wife. It changes the way that I relate to my kids. It changes the way that I relate to others. Two applications, and I'm done today. Application number one is this. You cannot be out of sync with others and in sync with God. You cannot be out of sync with others and in sync with God. Paul is describing what a Holy Spirit-controlled person looks like, and here's what Paul is saying. A person that is controlled by the Holy Spirit of God has their relationships in order. Now listen, I understand that doesn't happen all the time. Please don't walk away thinking that, that I'm a perfect husband all the time. I'm not, am I, Vicky? That was your chance to really brag on me publicly right there. That was your chance. Listen, I blow it at times too. It's not perfection that we're going for here. But, but the idea is this. As I submit to the Holy Spirit of God, he changes 
me. And he helps the selfish, conceited, prideful, self-serving man sacrifice myself for my wife. That doesn't come natural to me. I can only do it as the Holy Spirit of God empowers me. You see, the Holy Spirit of God helps this this man be the dad that I should be to to raise up my kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm not even sure I understand what that means, but the Holy Spirit of God comes alongside of me and helps me to do that. And when I submit to the control of the Holy Spirit of God, my relationships change. So I can't sit back and be out of sync with my husband or my wife or be in a relationship that is not honoring God and at the same time think that the Holy Spirit of God is controlling me. Paul said, that is an an anomaly. It cannot happen. A Holy Spirit-filled person has their relationships in order because it's the Holy Spirit of God that's doing it. That's the last thing I say is this. The Holy Spirit empowers you to have successful relationships. Relationships are tough, are they not? Does anybody agree with me today? They're tough. Any husbands out there willing to say, it's tough being a husband? No husbands are willing to say that, right? All right, all right. In the privacy of my office, you would tell me that, but here beside your wife, you're not willing to say that. Any wives that would say it's tough being a wife? A lot more wives raise their hand than husbands. Any parents say it's tough being a parent? I I spoke last night with a broken hearted dad that said, Brian, I just can't do it. I don't know what to do. Help me. I try to help him, but I'm not the Holy Spirit of God. And I have to look at him and say, listen, you have been given the greatest tool that exists to produce change in your life and in the life of your child. It's not a self-help book. It's not a class. It's not a television program. It's not a what is it. It's a who is it. And you were given the Holy Spirit of God who indwelt you for the purpose of changing you so that you can be the husband that God wants you to be, so that you can be the wife God wants you to be, so you can be the mom God wants you to be, the dad God wants you to be. It's only when we submit to the Holy Spirit of God that he changes us and he makes us who he wants us to be. Is there a connection today? Is there a connection in your life between what God says in his word and the way you're living your life? Is there a connection between what God says in your word and the way you're living out your personal life? That's what Paul says. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't let anything else control you. You be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And when the Holy Spirit controls you, those relationships are gonna work out and you're gonna honor me in your relationships. 